So welcome to our attendees that we have online this afternoon. My name is Nejla. I am the Project Officer for Partner Employment with Defence Families of Australia. And I'm joined this afternoon by my colleague, Michelle, who is our Communications Officer. Hi, everyone. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to our to their elders past, present and emerging. So here in Canberra, we are on Ngunnawal and Nambri ground. So thank you. It's um, extra so, cold today too. Yes, <laughs> very <laughs> cold today. <laughs> So joining us on our panel today, we have Lydia from Prince's Trust Australia. Hi everyone. We have Varen from, who's representing Workling this afternoon, but has his own fantastic, interesting business that I want to find out more about the game. And also Michelle, who has created Workling. So a absolutely fantastic platform. So I'll let them talk a little bit more about what they do in a minute. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping as we get started. The attendees are all on mute this afternoon. If you do have any questions, please put them into the Q&A. We will answer them if we have time. Otherwise, if we can't get to your questions, we will answer them either on social media or directly with you after the webinar. Uh, so today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on YouTube afterwards. If you are interested, then our previous webinars are already up on YouTube for you to have a little bit of a look at. So kicking off this afternoon, Lydia, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and Prince's Trust? Uh, hi, everybody. Um, hopefully, uh, some folks might know who Princess Trust Australia is, um, but we're a not for profit, a national not for profit that's part of a global network of charities uh, with our vision inspired by our founder and president, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, otherwise fondly known as Prince Charles. Uh, we've got three portfolios uh, sustainable communities, young people, and defence members and their families. And uh, what we build out is an entrepreneurial training program in order to support uh, transitioning members, veterans and ADF partners uh, as they explore self-employment as an option to create an agile career and part of your agile career. Um, do you want me to hand it over to Workling for a little uh, good day, an introduction? You said Thanks. also, Lydia, you're a partner as well. I think some, that's good when the audience sure. knows that you're a... I'm, I'm an ADF partner and, <laughs> uh, yep, absolutely. Um, Living the yeah. dream. I'm a wife, mum of two. And uh, I should also mention too, I've almost got 20 years exclusively of working as a freelancer and a contractor. Um, so that's been a very positive uh, experience for me and uh, happy to share all my experiences. Thanks, Thank you, Lydia. Michelle. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Fotheringham. I am the founder of a startup called Workling. What we do at Workling is match business leaders with amazing on-demand talent. So when I say on-demand talent, I'm talking about freelancers, professional gig workers, people who have escaped corporates. Um, so not only do we help people who are self-employed to access awesome gigs, but we also create a sense of community for those who work in this kind of new work model. A lot of people who might hear my dog barking in the background. What's a webinar okay. without a barking yeah. dog? <laughs> All okay. Um, a lot of people who opt out of corporate roles love this new flexibility and freedom of working on demand. But what they miss is being part of a team and having that community around them. So that's um, that's another big part of what we do at Workling. Um, I've actually met Viren through Workling. So he is one of our awesome talent members at Workling. So I'll, I'll hand over to you, Viren. Fantastic. Thank you. So I'm here with uh, two hats on. Uh, one hat is I'm a member of the uh, fantastic Workling platform. And um, there's a whole range of reasons for that, which I'm sure we'll unpack in the in, in the call. Um, Michelle's mentioned some of those. So that's kind of one hat. I, I do spend some time freelancing. And then I also spend time I'm co founder of a business called in the game, which I started uh, just over two and a half years ago. So I'm hoping to share some insights from that side of things of what it's like to start a business and some of the ups and downs, uh, the high points and challenges and that type of thing. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess we'll start off with what are we actually talking about when we're talking about self-employment? Because I kind of see it as a little bit of a spectrum. That's my own personal opinion. So you start off at, at one end that you're employed full time with an organization. Um, and then sometimes you might be employed contracting with an organization or else you then move into what I would consider a little bit more of self-employment where you move over into a, a freelance with an organization all the way down to having your, your own business. Um, so is that the way that the rest of the panel see it? Yeah, I suppose self-employment can take lots of different forms, but you know, whether you're mowing lawns, you're cutting people's hair, or you're working in a professional capacity. I suppose the, the cohort that I tend I work with and have been myself have been more in that professional capacity. Usually what that looks like um, is working under your own ABN or a company structure. Um, so you start to play a little bit more of a vendor role to an organisation. So you're getting mm. paid via invoicing. So that involves, you know, getting a bit more of those logistics like insurance and, you know, tax and mm. all of those kind of fundamentals. I'm not going to start giving tax advice, um, <laughs> but really setting yourself up as a business. So whether that works in, uh, as I said, doing freelancing work, so building on the experience that you've gained throughout your career and offering that as a service, whether you're actually building a product um, and, you know, or a website or any kind of, um, you know, scalable type solution like Viren has been doing with some of his work. So it can look slightly different uh, in different ways, different places. But mm. certainly, you know, from what I've seen, it's people gaining that experience and building that network through their career up to a point that they can step out and start to engage a little bit differently in the way that they offer their expertise. Mm. It's interesting you bring up networking, Michelle, because um, I've been having a big, big think about that. And when I started out as a freelancer, it was straight from university. So you, you come out and everyone else is freelance and within that network, um, and you're not competitive because everyone's got their own skill set. But often it can mean that's how you get your next job or um, you, you, it, you, it, it's more than just um, a support group. It's actually um, you know, a resource um, that you can really draw from. And it is harder for folks um, perhaps you may have, uh, for example, you may have had a career before children. That's how I see my life often. <laughs> <laughs> my life before children and after children. Um, and, uh, and then you're often thinking about how you can uh, draw from some of those uh, experiences into now starting yourself up as a freelancer, as a contractor. And it's about how do you get those networks started in a way that can help support you, not just with your confidence, but also uh, with as a resource for um, getting gigs <laughs> so I personally think that self-employment potentially is a really good option for ADF partners um, when we were talking about this um, last week Varen I think you said something incredibly insightful about having those multiple income streams mm. and then creating your own stability so can you sort of expand on that one a little bit more for us yeah sure look I, for me i, I view self-employment as anything you're you're doing yourself to generate your own income and i think when you have that hat on you can be doing that in many ways and, and in fact you can you know you could have a part-time role and also be self-employed having a business on the side as well. So I think when you have the hat on that, actually anything that I do myself to generate and control my own income for me is a form of self-employment. And I actually think one of the things I really like about being a member of Workling and also then running in the game is trying to diversify the different ways I can bring in income. That's quite powerful because let's say, for example, the business is going through a little bit of a tricky spot. You know, I can look at upping the amount of freelance work that I do. If the business is going really well, capacity is a little bit lower, maybe I do a little bit less freelancing work. But what I've found over the two and a half years, it ebbs and flows. There'll be points where things are going really well, things are, where it's indifferent, things where, you know, a little bit more challenging. And the more different income streams you can kind of draw on, um, I think the better positioned you are uh, to cope with ups and downs that happen. Absolutely. And it can also help you then identify some unique value that you have 
uh, for example, I was a relatively mediocre audio engineer in my day. I was also a relatively mediocre stage manager in my day. So I never quite excelled in either of those things. But what I could do and what was quite unique uh, to the industry at the time was I could do both at the same mm. time. And particularly in the arts industry, uh, it was struggling with wages to be able to support um, touring productions. So for someone to be able to do two in one, brilliant. And so I found a little niche that at the time didn't exist. So yeah. I think it's really interesting, you know, Viren and Lydia's points around different income streams, so different offerings that you're taking to market and also different organisations you're working with. It's, I find it really interesting because when you start to look at it in the context of job security, which traditionally we've seen security coming in the form of permanent full-time jobs, but when you reflect on the last year, the number of people that unfortunately were made redundant, um, you know, is quite a hefty group of people. When you start to look at people who are self-employed, yes, a lot of them were very heavily impacted. But if you were someone who had multiple different offerings and streams of income, you're working across multiple different clients. Yes, you might have lost two of your five clients, but that you still had a level of income. So I'm not suggesting it's more or less um, job security that's offered, but it's just a little different way to look and challenge to what we've traditionally seen job security. If I could just... Um interrupt for a sec we've just got a couple of comments and questions um one from or from Leanne actually so Leanne said that's a great perspective from Viren it doesn't have to be all or nothing self-employment is a great gap filler for those that have had that strong need for contribution as well as that feeling of independence um, so that's a good comment from Leanne um, Another question is, to be self-employed, there is so much more than professional, administrative and academic qualifications. Is that something that is going to be discussed? So that's something to put in your back pocket for this conversation. And the first question from Leanne is, um, which I think is going back to what Michelle was talking about um, with engagement with Workling, what type of lengths of time are we talking about by the hour, day, week or more extended or some of all of these options, I'm thinking it's possibly all of these options. Hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I think, you know, I talk a lot about the talent ecosystem. Um, we spoke, touched on it a little bit more at the start. So you've kind of got your employees, your contractors, you've got these different pieces and they're breaking off kind of as we speak into different, um, different work models. What I tend to think about in terms of contractors would be someone who is more engaged potentially through a labour hire organisation or directly through the uh, company for longer chunks of time. So it might be a six month contract or a 12 month contract at an agreed day rate. People who work freelance, typically, as we've just said, are juggling multiple different streams and multiple pieces of work. So sometimes they work on a day rate, sometimes they um, work on a retainer, sometimes it's a statement of work, so they actually scope up the project. Now that might be deliverable over two weeks or it might be a six month piece of work. So it's quite variable, but I tend to kind of draw the line a little bit um, around how that engagement is looking from a, you know, length of time and also the you know number of days it would possibly take up so that kind of distinction between contractor and consultant um yeah can can vary yeah for sure and i think um because obviously we try to hire adf partners that have come through our cohorts for any particular um, need so for example some have come through as copywriters or graphic designers um, and what we tend to do is try to build out a big pool of work, but then something that they can then manage um, all of the deadlines within their own structure. So it would be just we're just one of the many uh, for them, um, but obviously try to pull it together so that it um, sort of sits as a good chunk of work as opposed to you know, something else. Um, but yeah, I think it's really interesting, Michelle. Um, yeah, what you were saying about um, I think Leanne also mentioned about the, the sense of purpose. Is that correct? Um, because that, that was something for me that was really important, knowing that with every posting, I had a sense of purpose. It was, okay, here's my clients. What, what other uh, opportunities can I get in this state? Um, so there was a momentum that I brought, um, but also I didn't see myself as, you know, Mrs. Army wife either. I was there going in and you know, call up a festival and say, hey, I'm here to work and 
get a three month contract, um, which would be fine to keep you going until you find your roots somewhere else and yeah, build up the client base. Yeah. It's really interesting. And I am not a, a spouse and I've really never had any connection with the defense force. Um, and it was just through a DFA um, post. I think it was probably on LinkedIn that I stumbled across it and just read some of the statistics around some of the challenges that partners face in terms of employment um, and, you know, the length of time out of work and, and some of those barriers and reached out and just started a conversation around how can Workling help? Because we've got this community and, you know, is there a way that we can support partners who do work in this freelance capacity in that regardless of where they're moving, we can kind of be a bit of a professional community that moves with them, um, which was kind of where, you know, my interest um, came from. I just had never been yeah. exposed to defence life before and understanding some of the challenges that partners um, take, uh, that, um, yeah, partners I think face. We're, I think we're quite vocal within our own community, but we tend to not you know, scream about it outside. We, we all talk about the ups and downs of defence life, but we don't tend to, you just get on mm. with it. And the, there is this hugely untapped talent pool of military partners out there who want and, and need to work. And um, actually Leanne's just commented, keep it in the family, which is probably true. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so it's, it's I'm, I'm as the communications person, I'm very pleased that you saw that on your social media, Michelle, that's excellent feedback. Um, <laughs> so, so but, mm. Michelle, um, Workling Michelle, not my Michelle <laughs> number one. <laughs> okay, Michelle number one. So within the Workling community and generally, what sort of op occupations are you seeing tend to adapt well to a freelancing consulting type arrangement? Mm. Well, within Workling, um, we are still in our early days, probably kind of 18 months into our journey. And we've we've started our community really around where my network is, whether we expand that more broadly down the track, who knows. But within our community, we've got lots of people from the people and culture, HR type background, marketing comms, strategy, experience design, uh, community development is, is who we've got within our community. What I love in freelancers and independent consultants are people who, they're not career consultants. They've done lots of different things within organisations. Some of the frustration I hear from businesses when they're dealing with big consulting agencies, it's all a little bit cookie cutter um, and the consultants possibly don't have the experience of actually working within an organisation and making some of these changes or programs come to life. So within our, within our community, we're seeing a lot of people who have built up their career working inside organisations and then they step out and to start their freelancing life. And what I'm finding is that they're the really good people because they've got their skills and experience and capabilities and network to a point that they can cough, confidently step out. Having said that, of course, there's lots of people that gig in the tech space um, and, you know, as I said before, cutting hair, mowing lawns, it could really work um, very well in a lot of different capacities. There's a lot of different gig platforms. There's a lot of big global, you know, whether you're talking Upwork, um, Freelancer, those type of platforms that will really cover the spectrum. In our community, we're focusing on those highly experienced professional services type capabilities. Australia businesses are kind of lagging behind how they tap into the gig economy. So we're working and playing in a space where we're helping them bridge that gap in a bit more mm. of a safer way with talent who is peer recommended um, and has that, you know, depth of in-house experience behind them. And but I think the formula is going to work in many different fields because people want to work in this way. Mm. It's not about casualising the workforce and the challenges that come with, you know, your driver delivery elements of the gig economy. There's a big difference between talking about a driver in terms of vulnerability and a consultant who charges, you know, yeah. very good day rates. Um, so it can work well in yeah, lots of different um, mm. context and quite often it's giving people the flexibility to the flexibility that they didn't find when they were working in-house and the flexibility 
to start designing their work and their life within one. So you're not like work is something that happens between nine and five and then life is what happens at these other times. It's about owning your week and creating, you know, that design of work and life that best meets where you're at. So Beren, question for you. Why did you step out of the corporate space into freelance? Yeah. Can I, do you mind if I just add one thing to what Michelle was sure. saying around the diversity of skills? <laughs> Only from the perspective of actually when you're running a business, you're not going to be able to do everything. And actually what you also want to be able to do is tap into other gig workers. So sorry, Michelle, I do use Upwork and um, I can't remember that <laughs> you know uh, software development type work and graphic design type work so actually it's awesome as a business owner to also then tap into the gig economy to make up for skills that you potentially don't have so you don't actually need to be able to do absolutely everything there's specialists so many different domains that you can you can work together mm. with in terms of the question sorry Nedula, it was around why did i start yeah why <laughs> uh so my story is a little bit that that's where it's i, I always knew i wanted to start my own business went up from when I was a teenager I was running little businesses in high school making business cards for people uh, like doing all kinds of, I was doing actually actually doing graphic design work and um, bits of IT work when I was like 13 and 14 so I've always wanted to do do my own thing I think the the big driver for me I'm one of my biggest drivers is autonomy and so we talked about security I find security when I've got kind of I dictate a little bit about what what happens um, mm. my career and how I how I go about winning work and bringing in income I like that for me that's security it's actually not relying on someone else to generate income for me it's being able to generate income self-sufficiently I'm really I get a really big kick out of that um, and also I, I really like I've got a you know I want to have a big impact on the world and I, I feel like I've got a quite a very clear vision about what I want to do and, and I think running a business enables me to do that I know the types of people I want to work with. I know what I want to, you know, broadly what I want to achieve. And I think you get a, again, there's a really big kick out of running a business because you've got control over all of that. Mm. A lot of pride in it. Um, Buren, when you do take on um, other employees or, or I should say uh, freelancers, uh, what's something that um, you really, uh, you need from them? Do they need to be easy as people <laughs> to get along with? You know, like you, you're throwing them something that you can't, manage and they are able to just pick it up go with it spit it back at you and is you know what, what what are you sort of looking for yeah it's a really good question look for me often it's uh, I'm someone that's got to get a really clear picture in my mind's eye of I want I want something so um you know I'll use software development as an example there's certain things that I need building out and I can't do them myself so I've got a really clear picture in my mind of what it is ideally what I want to be able to do is someone kind of gets it is able to execute it, but not just that. I think what elevates them is the way they add their expertise and insight and kind of go, hey, what you're thinking here is actually, based on what you've told me, not the best way to go about doing things. And so they're not just an order taker. There's someone that kind of understands what I'm thinking and then can take it to another another level. So I think there's that part around, okay, translating, because I think when you, I've got, as I say, got a specific thing that I'm looking to execute. So they need to be able to kind of pull that out of me. And then I think the, part of the execution piece is the communication. I think where the, the good freelancers that I work with, the good software developers or graphic designers, they're good communicators as well. And good communication, you know, I'm often working with uh, freelancers where English is not the preferred language. The communication is just, it's, it's regular though. They keep you kind of updated. It's not necessarily about, you know, English language profici proficiency, but it's around, I know where things are up to. If they're unsure, they're checking with me to get back on the right page. Um, it's prompt. If something's actually going off track, they're up, up front with that as well. So I think helping me articulate what I need to achieve and then the up, you know, upfront communication, they'd be two of the big, big qualities for me. Mm. If we were to put them into enterprise skills, we'd be looking at self-management, critical thinking, um, and then communication and yeah. innovation. Yeah. Brilliant. I think, you know, just touching on... Um, Viren's point around constant communication and just, you know, wanting to almost lift up the idea and the vision you already had. One thing I've been thinking a lot late, lately is I think there can be a perception that people who work as freelancers or independent consultants are a bit flaky or they don't care as much as an employee. But the more I've been thinking about it, the more it's just crystallised is 
actually when you were, and I'm not going to suggest that they care more, but when you work for yourself, there is no room for complacency. There's no room, room to phone it in for the day or the week. Like you, your next gig is dependent on your ability to deliver this gig and you're so reliant on your reputation that you are going to kick goals. <laughs> like you, you're going to deliver. So that's been my big kind of, I don't know, just epiphany recently mm. that there's a real kind of shift in mindset that I think we need to take uh, for people who work in this way. I'm also picking up on something else that I've seen you post on LinkedIn in regards to how um, permanent employees and freelancers can work together on a project and it ends up coming out. I had a conversation with someone over lunch a couple of weeks ago and they were they were up for a full-time role and they were like, it's a really interesting role and I really want to do it, but I don't want to work full-time. And I said to them, well, you can always get the job. I've just had a cat walk into my backyard. I need to shut that door. <laughs> I want back. Actually, we might um, on that. Do you want to, uh, Lydia, are you right to do some talking about how Princess Trust um, can support uh, ADF partners in in, yeah. in finding their vision for a a small business that they could take around with them and um, you know create their own stability. Absolutely. Um, so uh, probably something that I didn't make really clear, but uh, obviously I'm um, absolutely love this program uh, because it is about um, supporting partners to help pursue their own rewarding, purpose driven, and agile careers um, and. So part of this uh, is really tapping into an entrepreneurial training program that we offer that's free to everyone. Um, but it is also about not just the skill set that you come out with, but a network. And I, and I mentioned this before, but I really think that's a huge foundation um, for setting you up for success um, and also the confidence, um, I think. So I'll just quickly, I don't want to bore you with a uh, PowerPoint presentation, um, but, uh, you know, a lot of the folks that are probably listening today uh, really tapping into why we want to think about self-employment um, and Michelle has mentioned that the independence is just invaluable um, because you do get to be your own boss um, and you really are in control of what you're taking on. Um, you're in control of when you're taking it on and for me uh, I found it really valuable to not take on any work during posting periods um, and <laughs> I have to say that was amazing. Um, and uh, it's, it's very tricky in a full-time role to continue. Uh, you're also choosing your own destiny, um, which is also you're able to apply your skills, the things that you love to do. Um, and, you know, it's so nice to be thanked for that and a little tap on the shoulder. Good job, well done. Moving on to the next one. Uh, financial success as well. Um, I know for a lot of partners, this, you know, trying to build up a, uh, you know, it's hard to compete in terms of what your defence partner's wages might be. Um, so often that's not the, the reason why you're going into business. Um, however, it is really nice to have that little extra. Um, and we are a nation of small business owners. Um, if you were to look at uh, most of the businesses in, in Australia, 62% are sole traders. So you're joining a gang. Um, Courtney Snowden, who's a mum of two, ADF partner, and has come through our cohorts, a freelance copywriter. She turned her 10-year uh, journalism career into something now that's a lot more agile, that can withstand some of the pressures of military life, um, balancing kids, partners away a lot, um, but also posting where you're going to be next. She just takes the work with her. Um, so as she says here, going into small business has meant I get the final say on my workload and how it fits around my family needs. Sometimes it's as simple as that. Um, here's a couple of our little businesses. Um, to some of our defence partner businesses that have come through just recently. Um, and uh, you, can, you can see that, we, you know, we've got financial services, um, we've got communications, um, journalism, uh, therapies. There are some products as well. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, new designers coming through and graphic designers. Um, you can see I've had a bit of fun with Canva. Um, so the way that folks can get involved too is you start off with our Enterprise Online program. It's quite, it's relatively light touch. It's only um, two hour, sorry, three two hour sessions. Uh, it's online, it's facilitated with some really great um, uh, people uh, that Workly know. 
Um, and uh, when I say light touch though, but what we're really doing is you're, you're really taking that time to consider uh, why you're going into business, which can actually help support a lot of your decision making moving forward. Uh, but also your jobs to be done theory, um, which I'll let you Google later on, but uh, it's really important in terms of identifying what it is the job that you are providing for your customers and understanding your customers and market need. Um, so that's just a little basis, but then uh, folks that uh, really feel like I'm motivated, I really wanna keep going, come with us, join us for the next part of the journey, which is the Connect. Uh, which is slightly longer. It's seven facilitated sessions, um, quite a few with our ADF Financial Services Consumer Centre. Um, and uh, part of that is that we'll really start to deep dive into sort of the more the financial, legal and operational responsibilities um, that just want to see, help set you up for success. Um, and uh, we'll help develop out your business canvas model, uh, which um, forms the next stages uh, of our program that we'll be launching later in the year. Uh, we've also got regular meetups. Um, again, coming back to that connection piece, you want to keep connected with other like-minded people in your community. Um, and also we, we sort of theme it around any feedback that we have. Um, so for example, in a few weeks, um, the next one is on how you can utilize third-party marketplaces. Um, I'm sure I'll get Workling on board at some point too uh, to present, um, but uh, it, it's an opportunity to sort of see, all right, I've got this service, I've got this uh, product, how can I get it out there and how can I, you know, benefit from uh, these other platforms? And just um, to clarify, Lydia, all this is free for great. IDF partners, totally absolutely. free. Totally free, absolutely. <laughs> uh, we're building out our CEO Circle mentoring program. Uh, so it's happening in Can uh, Canberra. Um, so we're pairing six mentors and six mentees together and, uh, again, be able to look at sort of more of the unique um, uh, requirements uh, and challenges of each uh, group uh, and then also constantly building out things so there's some pretty pictures of us girls um, and uh, we've got some lovely things going on but we're also really trying to keep connected on our LinkedIn groups and our Facebook groups um, just to keep the discussion going to keep connected I've trialed a mentor of the month program and I'll keep trialing it again um, which is an opportunity to be able to ask anything to that mentor and um, they will try and either give you an answer or point you in the right direction as to where to get that answer, um, just so that you know that you are supported uh, in whatever, wherever you are. Um, she, there's another comment from Leanne um, in regards to networking. This is so true. No great enterprise ever happened alone. It's accepting that the network is essential for plugging the gaps in our own skill sets in working for ourselves. So absolutely, very true. Absolutely. Um, and uh, folks can register to join, but um, I'll happy, happily share that uh, in the chat if you need. Um, but uh, is there any questions, Leanne? You seem to be our, <laughs> our question person. I might just jump in very quickly while Michelle number two is looking for questions, but <laughs> it just dawned on me as you were talking, Lydia, that, yeah. you know, perhaps this is stating the extreme obvious here, but obviously when we're, you know, talking about defence partners and how you know self-employment can be a great channel bricks and you know self-employment can also look like look like a bricks and mortar business so it's obviously not that sort of self-employment necessarily based on you know the conversations I've been a part of that would work best for these part uh, for partners but it's those highly you know transferable and transportable businesses so whether it's a digital product a digital service or a freelancing, you know, um, independent consultant business where you can really pick up and move on to different clients with anywhere um, that your partner is posted. So, I mean, I'm sure that distinction did not need to be called out, but, um, you know, I guess it's just that thinking about what is that type of self-employment that I can take with me. Mm. Um, we do have one question about the Princess Trust is what about ADF children? Are they covered as well as ADF partners? Very good question. Um, at the moment, we mm. haven't built that out. Um, but if we found that there was a need and a real interest, then absolutely would love to you know, pursue that as an idea. Um, so it's just a matter of communicating, hey, my 16 year old really wants to start up their own business. Um, and it's a good point to say, actually, um, 16 year olds, they don't need their, their parents to sign off on that ABN form. Um, so, and I, I start them young in terms of entrepreneurship. I, uh, 
I was 14 and had multiple businesses. Um, and I think that's uh, a really good way for folks to understand that it's not, to, I'm turn 18, I've got to go and get a job now. It's, it's actually something that's built in really young. But, and when we talk about families, mobility and moving around you're moving teenagers often as well sometimes so you know that's if, if they've if they're developing that entrepreneurial skills early they'll have something you know it's it's you do see in our community you know people moving to Canberra and they've got a someone who's just finished year 12 and they're not sure what they want to do and and they don't know anyone they don't have any networks and you know you know that's something that we can you know this type of of work and they could look at. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So now amazing. that the cat, <laughs> now that the cat has moved off my balcony and <laughs> the birds have stopped going crazy, and I don't have the risk of the dog rushing out if it notices it, keeping it real. <laughs> what sort of menagerie are you running? Is going on in the background there? Oh. Canberra, the bush capital. Yeah. <laughs> so some neighbor's cat has decided to come for a little explore. Um, so I was having this conversation. They were saying that they didn't want to work full time if they got this role. So I said to them, if you get this role, have a look at your job description and pick out the bits that you really want to do and that you're really strong at. And then pick out some other pieces that really are not necessarily business critical for you to be doing and have a talk to your new employer if you get the job about potentially getting a freelancer to do that so that you can go down to your your part-time hours that you want there's so much scope here to start using on-demand talent freelance talent to help enable greater flexibility for employees so often when someone goes from five days a week to three days a week, it's just a matter of those five days being crammed into three or otherwise they're um, pushed off into it. I'm trying not to swear today, so I won't use the word I usually <laughs> use to describe this, a special projects role. Um, whereas, you know, if you start going, okay, well, the full-time equivalent budget for this role is $100,000 and you only want to work three days a week, well, let's use this leftover chunk of money as a you know, fund for you to engage freelancers and for other people to help you succeed um, throughout the year. Um, I did a post on that recently on LinkedIn and um, yeah, I've been chatting yeah, with an organization. Exactly, yeah, so super keen to pilot something. So it's actually a great story. So they um, had someone reading, leading a really critical um, piece of work who'd been there for six weeks and she you know called the director and said I'm so sorry my father is very unwell I'm going to have to resign because I'm going to have to take care of him over the coming period of time and they're like you don't, don't resign like that's not what needs to happen like obviously if you want to but let's just work out a way to make this work so we're just working with them at the moment to see how can we start to use on-demand talent to bolster up the team while she, you know, has family commitments over the coming period. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, with uh, Workling, if you, um, can you be more than one person? And I only say this because everyone has so many different skill sets um, and obviously we were talking about, um, you know, diversifying. Is there a way of saying, okay, I can be a grant writer, I'm also a copywriter, I'm also, is, is that sort of how it works? in workling absolutely because yeah. <laughs> I've, I've had a little investigate on the workling platform as well I mean it was one of the first things that I did after I had a conversation with Michelle and yes all of the talent on there has what they want to be able to do so as an employer you can pick and choose yeah and, you know, we're also increasingly teaming people up on different projects. So they leverage the different strengths. But if you look at someone like Viren, who can, you know, run team performance workshops or come in and consult around the OKRs of an organisation, or he's got some awesome little Viren. Well, I'll let you, I'll stop talking about Viren. I'll let Viren talk about Viren. But Viren's very passionate. Viren is very passionate about game-based learning. So he tends to take all of these super boring HRE stuff and turn them into cool games. <laughs> please tell us more about that. I know it's going off topic just a little bit, but please tell us. 
Well, I, I'll try and I'll, I'll wrap it into the topic as well because um, so yeah, I, I, I do. I, I love. Uh, I've always loved games, board games, and video games. And I did have a an epiphany a good few years back around. Well, why don't we use these tools in businesses more? Like because people, whenever you see someone playing a game, you don't have to convince them to do anything. They're they're immersed. And if any of you play any any form of game, board game, video game, mobile phone game, they immediately hook you in. And there's certain really awesome mechanisms in games that build motivation and so you, my thinking was how do you take these things and put them um you know into the workplace and that's you know part of what my my business does but i think the broader kind of business lesson for me really is how do you no matter what your business and if you're looking to create a business i think the way i kind of separate freelancing out from a business with the business you may be looking to take some of your ideas and thinking and then put them in a way that they transcend you. So it goes beyond you. Now that might be in a software platform and it might be in a box in a game. And I actually think given, you know, many of you probably, you know, move, moving around um, quite regularly, that part around how do I create something that transcends location and transcends me could be quite important. And it doesn't need to be, a, I don't think it needs to be a huge thing to start off with. Sometimes it could be, let's say you are freelancing 95% of the time. Can you spend 5% of your time turning something you do into a small product or service that will benefit a customer group, a specific customer group? And that customer group can be anyone. And I think that's my mindset around creating kind of like a business and creating products is how can I take something, put it into a digital or physical package that then sells without me necessarily needing to, to be there. And I think, it, as I say, it doesn't need to be a huge thing. You can freelance 95% of the time, but spend some time building out these uh, products and services because I think they're very, very portable. And they're the things which, you know, um, Lydia, you mentioned around income. If you get that part right, your income becomes uncapped. And I think that's quite exciting. Not, not to say that's always going to happen, but that's where there is a tremendous amount of potential. I think that's the part that gets me quite excited is well once you can get something like that you the realms of what's possible uh, are endless um, I think yeah. the other um, you know the other piece about talking about what Viren does that just connects to connects back to this um, broader conversation is obviously his passion that just comes through very clearly. So, you know, I think if you hate your job, you know, if you're a copywriter or a you know someone who works in you know, IR or whatever, and you hate doing IR or you hate doing copywriting, going out and doing it, you know, at a freelance capacity or trying to create some sort of product around that probably isn't going to fill your bucket. But if you've got something, you know, that energizes you, like in the case of Viren, you know, the game-based learning and starting to reinvent some of these processes and, you know, tools that exist within organizations to support their kind of high-performing culture. If it's something that you're excited about, and then it's also something that's your own, um, you know, it's a pretty cool way to live. It is. I think that's, sorry to tap onto that, because I think that, I think if we're talking about self-employment, we do have to talk a little bit about some of the parts that are more challenging. And this is where actually tapping into, you know, who are the, who are the customers that you really like working with? What are you actually, what, is, what really does get light a fire in you? The reason that's really important is there's two things that are very, very evident when you're running your own thing it is going to be an up and down process. So there's going to be lows. It's because it's, you've got to generate everything yourself, all the momentum, all the energy, all the ideas, at least at the beginning. So you need to have a certain fire lighting you to get you through some of the lower parts. And the other part is the re 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 reality of it is you've got to sell yourself or your services or something. And I think if you've got a natural fire there, it makes the selling feel less icky. I very rarely feel, feel like I'm selling because I just love what I'm doing. Um, but if you don't love it, it's going to be much harder to sell what you do. And that is a really key part of whether you're freelancing or whether you're running your own thing. So I think, you, you know, I think that that's a lot of the work, Lydia, you, when we were speaking, that's what you do is helping people tap into that. And I think that's, it's really key is it, why am I actually doing this? And for me, it's particularly what customers do I want to work with and what kind of impact do I want to have? Understanding that will help you with those two big challenges, which are real in running a business or freelancing. Hmm. I sometimes think of, I have, I really should think out my theory a little bit more before I announce it to the world. But um, I often think about when you're starting... Never stop me, Lydia. Go for it. <laughs> this is where we think of it, Ben. Um, often when you're starting up a business um, or, or, you know, really exploring an idea or exploring on self-employment, um, 
I often think of it as like writing act one of a play or a, or a screenplay. Everyone, everyone can, you know, you're putting it down, you're setting up the scene, you're really thinking this is how I want it to play and people come unstuck on the second act. Mm. And uh, it's quite a common thing. Uh, I don't know how many of you have got screenplays sitting on your laptop um, <laughs> where you've only got to the, the first act. Um, and, and so I think that's right when you really identify your why you want to do it and who your customers are as being sort of this core fundamental it can really push you through your second act of your play um, and, and, and through your planning of, of the next stage. And that's something obviously that Princess Trust can we can help yes. you to develop. We can. So for free. Just to throw that in. <laughs> and, uh, we, and we've built out dedicated cohorts for ADF partners this year um, and that's uh, come from obviously there's a, they're full so but keep coming we will make more we will make them bigger. Um, but um, so two quick comments for you. Yeah. Um, so one is from Amy, who Amy Martin, who you know. Oh, hey. um, Lydia, generalist for the win. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that... yeah. Generalist, absolutely. But I've yep. quite, quite liked, and that's how I've actually built out my, my career. I've been relatively a general, generalist. And, um, but uh, I guess I've had a real niche um, customer. So and for me, it was the contemporary performing arts, <laughs> um, but, and which is quite niche. Um, but at the same time, it allowed for a lot of diversity. And for me, it just I was able to bring energy to every gig um, because it was all stuff I really wanted to see well done. And just another quick one um, in regards to Princess Trust programs. So uh, current ADF partners, and what about partners of veterans? So yes. people who have, yes. Absolutely, yep. yep. And uh, recently we had a, a partner of a, a veteran come through, got an MBA and, and has a, an incredible business up and running. And sometimes you think, oh, what are you getting out of us that you haven't already got from, you know, these experiences? And it comes back to the network. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, so ADF partners sticking together is fantastic. Yep, thank you. <laughs> Actually, that's been one of my biggest surprises. When I first, uh, first started the business, I thought it's going to, this is going to be super cutthroat. Everyone's going to be, you know, out, out to get you. And actually what I found is the small business community is really supportive. Don't get me wrong. It, it's very, very competitive out there, mm. but it's actually people are, it's actually, it's, it just blows me away almost every, you know, every week I'm blown away by the amount of support within, you know, the small, small business community. Um, so that, that it's, it's a really, uh, neat part if you can tap into these communities that do exist it's uh again we talked about the resilience piece and there are lows i mean community is one of the best ways to help you ride through the lows it's, it's essential actually you, you, I think mm. you can't can't just go it alone it can be very lonely working by yourself and particularly as a military partner when you move to random locations uh and you don't always have that um physical network as well so that's one of the things that i liked about workling as well is that you you've got that real community connection piece in there as well. So, and having those little reminders come up that these meets are happening now. And, mm. and, and if there was online. ever a time in history that we needed to be just a little bit more connected, I'm pretty sure it's 2021. Absolutely. And I think that digital connection, you know, my learning last year is that face-to-face -face connection just isn't actually as needed as much as what I thought it was like I've developed some really strong friendships with people that I've never met before and we still laugh at the fact we haven't actually met face to face yet um, and I think you know Viren spoken to the kind of highs and lows of, of self-employment and I think you know one of my <clears throat> learnings over the last couple of years is just around relationships so yes relationships with fellow um gig workers or business owners is really important, but relationships with customers and potential customers is really important. Depending on the type of work that you do impacts the sales lead time. And I'm not a salesperson. This is all stuff that I've just learned over the last few years. But if you're talking about, um, you know, higher end consulting work, you don't just go and have a coffee with someone and they're like, oh, actually, yeah, I want to redesign my whole organization. Can you start on Monday? Like it just doesn't happen what will happen is that they might call you in six months time. So it can take a while to get your name out there and, you know, have those relationships build. But I think, you know, my advice would be, you know, just get better at 
keeping in touch with your network. And it's not about trying to sell to them. It's just about fostering those relationships within the different organisations that you want to work with. And I think where hopefully it will become a little bit easier for defence um, partners is that where you're located is becoming less and less mm. relevant to this type of work. Um, you know, we've regularly getting people to do gigs that are done interstate. Like it just doesn't matter. So yes, you know, um, fostering your just general business network but then also, you know, when you are moving locations, how can you immediately start, you know, building new relationships within that location as well? I mean, for all, depending on where you're based, you might be one of very few people that actually do that type of work. Um, yeah, so just the relationships and, you know, particularly if it's a B2B business that you're setting up, getting really active on LinkedIn and social media and looking at ways to, you know, publish articles. And I mean, that was actually advice Viren gave me at the very start of Workling was, you know, get active. It's not going to pay off straight away, but it'll pay pay off down the track, which has proven. I didn't believe him for a long time, but it did eventually prove to be true. Um, so yeah, they're kind of my bits of advice that from my learnings over the last. Yeah, year. or it's very sim very similar to. I did another webinar a couple of weeks ago about career portfolios. Um, very very interesting chat with Amanda McHugh, if anyone was interested in that one. Um, but part of that was looking at ensuring that on your career portfolio, or at least for your own personal benefit, that the entire scope of your experience is covered. So not just paid, also unpaid experience. And I shared on that one that when I was looking at moving out of restaurants and into something a little bit more stable corporate I had two options so I was either going to look and in, moving into consulting for restaurants um, I was also looking at moving into sort of marketing or PR obviously I didn't do either of those I took option three and moved into HR but my consulting work was paid and my PR work was unpaid but my PR work taught me the skills of networking mm -hmm. And at that stage, it was most definitely in-person networking that just wasn't the, the virtual side of it. But then that does translate into the virtual side as well. And it's those networking skills that I've continued to use over my career and have been potentially much more valuable for me than the paid consulting work because it was stuff that I already knew anyway. Mm. So. So, you know, the idea of networking to me, look, like sounds <laughs> disgusting. It's just, ugh. but like for me, it's just getting to know people. And I'm also just a big believer in karma. So yes, I ask, you know, the amazingly successful people that I've been able to get time with through their just generosity is, you know, amazing. So when I have people reach out to me who might just be finishing university or are thinking about stepping into freelancing, I also give those people some time so I think you know it's all swings and roundabouts and if you um you know are generous with your own time with others but also not be afraid to I've met with deputy secretaries and see like it's crazy who will actually agree to have a chat to you when really you know as long as you're going in they're genuinely just wanting to learn about what's happening within their business or the challenges that they're seeing within a particular area not going into sell no one wants that um, but, you know, you can extend your network through real, um, you know, authenticity. Mm. So I am conscious that we're now coming up against time. So I think to wrap up, we've been talking a lot about the advice piece at the moment. So I think that's what I would like to finish up on. So I'm going to ask each of our panellists to have a little think about what's the one piece of advice that they would give to ADF partners who were looking for either a little bit more job security, look, thinking about moving into freelance or own business. What's the one thing that you either piece of advice or you wish someone had told you before you started? Michelle, do you want to start? I'm it, I'm it. Um, my one piece of advice, um, so as I said before, I'm very 
thankful that I listened to Viren on the kind of social media side of things. The other thing that I did when I first started freelancing myself, because I was like, just not a networker, I was very bad at, I don't know, reaching out to people was I made a list of the 10 people that I loved working with throughout my career. So I thought back to even my first few jobs, there's always those people that just stand out to you is gosh, we were like, you know, we were work besties then, or, um, you know, my work husband or work wife. Think back of just all those people you just loved working with. And it doesn't matter if you haven't seen them in 10 years or in eight years, reach out to them and they are going to be thrilled and you'll have a great old catch up and it'll feel like you saw them yesterday. So in terms of just getting started on that networking, my advice would be start there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. Theron. I think my advice is a good question. I think if I had to go with one piece, it would be uh, keep an open mind. I think that's the biggest one. Keep an open mind about what it can look like, what what you end up doing. Um, I think keep the doors open because the one thing I've definitely found over the two and a half years, it, it, just, it changes very frequently. So even when you think, oh yeah, I've got the idea, I've got the thing, it then evolves and then changes. And I think the that's the best thing you could do is keep an open mind listen to listen to and seek feedback from others seek input from others um and be open-minded about what it can look like it doesn't need to be one thing it can be lots of little things um it can be one big thing it can be two two medium-sized things i think so having that open open mind around what how can i piece this together and what 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 it can look like i think super beneficial thank you lydia um uh i've got so much advice i always give advice but um <laughs> I, I think something that's quite relevant uh, at the moment when I talk to a lot of ADF partners is to uh, not let the imposter syndrome get in the way um, because you're not alone in those thoughts, you're not alone in those feelings. And they'll, it will, unfortunately, it's something that we, we all carry around with us from time to time. But you're in charge of that as well. And um, it's, just a, it's just important to, to keep that imposter in check. I don't know how you would refer to an imposter. But yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And I also, something that I'm going to suggest at this stage is that for anyone who's even thinking about this, think about something that you enjoy doing. And if someone was going to give you money for doing something, what would you want them to give you money for? Um, and I think also talking to Lydia and also Jasmine at Princess Trust is talking they've been talking to a lot of partners who don't actually think of what they do as a business and so they don't prioritize it as they would a business so when you are looking at diversifying your income stream however that may look is think about what it is that you love to do and if you can make money from it you can turn it into a business sometimes there's something nice about actually owning it too yeah Oh, I do nannying on the side. Hey, how about you set up some structure around it and own it, you know, feel good in it. Um, mm. I don't work. Yes, you do. Um, and so sometimes it's just nice to, to have that sense of purpose. I think that's great advice. I think, you know, a part of, you know, being out, owning it, that you are a business owner. Yeah, there's a risk it might flop, but, you know, who cares? Just own it and, you know, be bold and brave that you're trying something different. And I think, sorry, that it comes down to the sell as well. I think, you know, if you could go to someone and say, hey, I nanny on the side or I'm a professional nanny, who are you going to hire out of those two people? You know, it, almost every time it's going to be the professional nanny. So I think that owning it, actually, it becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of mm. you start doing the things a professional nanny would do versus, hey, I nanny on the, on the side. You got the goods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I would like to say a huge thank you to our panel. Um, as I said at the beginning, I really truly think that um, having your own business or generating your own income is a fantastic way for defence partners to create their own security. Because the reality is that we live in a, a lifestyle that can be very unstable for us. Um, so 
this is a way of taking back some of that control. How and however it looks for you, um, and it can look very, very different for different people. So thank you very much to the panel. Thank Thanks you everyone so much. It was terrific. Thank you. I'm going to end it now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you.